Madam Speaker, yesterday was International Artists' Day. Nos artistes et créateurs. Our artists and creators in Canada are among the most talented in the world. They help to make our experience known and promote innovation through their creativity. Edmonton has produced some of that remarkable talent enjoyed worldwide. This includes musicians like the late maestros Tommy Banks and Brian Kipping, or playwright actor Darren Hagen and recent inductees to Edmonton's Arts Culture Hall of Fame like saxophone player Raymond Barrow, choreographer Shelley Switzer and choir master Laurier Fagnan. We would not be able to support and celebrate so many artists without all of those who support the arts, from patrons who buy tickets to a Winspear show, the Edmonton Opera or the Art Gallery of Alberta, to philanthropists such as Diane and Irv Kipnis, who have a long legacy of supporting Edmonton and Canadian artists. Thank you and congratulations to all artists from coast to coast to coast. Hey, hey, hey. Oral questions. Questions oral, the Honourable Member for Carlton. Hey, hey, hey. The Prime Minister promised that the budget will be balanced next year, but this year the deficit is three times higher than promised. This week, the Bank of Canada increased intra the interest rate, which will force Canadians to pay higher taxes to pay for the interest on our debt. It's money for bankers and not for hospitals and highways. Will the economic statement tell us exactly when the budget will be balanced, yes or no. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. I would like to remember the member that in 2015, Canadians had a choice between austerity or growth, and we promised to give more to the middle class, and the results speak for themselves. We have the strongest growth in the G7 in the last year, and this year the OECD said that Next year, Canadian families will be $2,000 richer than under the previous government because we are counting on what counts on the welfare of Canadians. The question was when the budget would be balanced. We still don't have an answer from this government. This Prime Minister, on another subject, is a high-tax hypocrite. He raised taxes on families by, he, by, by, by taking away the children's fitness tax credit, by taxing their, uh, the, taking away their tuition tax credit and their education tax credit, while protecting his tax-funded nannies for himself. Now he has extended a, a sweetheart deal to large corporate industrial emitters while forcing others to pay the carbon tax. Will small businesses get the same exemption? I just. I just want to remind the member that uh, it's not uh, parliamentary language to uh, call other members' names, and so I would hope that he will uh, uh, excuse his language um, after the fact. Uh, the Honourable uh, Minister of Environment I need to and climate to stand up and talk about our climate plan because I'm always hopeful that the other side will learn to understand that one. The climate change is real. Two, we need to take action. And three, there's an economic opportunity. But let me talk about what folks are saying about our plan. The CEO of the Toronto Regional Board of Trade. A successful price on carbon should be transparent, revenue neutral, and provide support for trade-exposed industry. The board is encouraged with this announcement, largely satisfies those objectives. We look forward to working with the federal government to ensure the support provided to small and medium-sized businesses helps them re remain competitive. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, it's no surprise that CEOs are happy with the Liberal carbon tax. That's part of the high-tax hypocrisy, right? They get exempted if they run large industrial corporations. They get a 90 percent exemption on their admissions, while small businesses like plumbers and carpenters and pizza shop owners will pay the tax on 100 percent of the energy they use to run their businesses. So a simple yes or no question. Will small businesses get the same exemption from the Liberal carbon tax as the large industrial emitters? Yes or no? Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Yes. Want to know, yes or no, do the Conservatives have a climate plan that's going to meet their target? Yes. 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 
Canadians would love to see this climate plan, but let's be clear, we have put a price on pollution for everyone, whether you're a small business or a big business, or all Canadians, because we know that polluting isn't free, that we've done this in a way that makes sense, that ensures that companies are competitive, and will also put more money in the pockets of Canadians, because we know everyone wants to be part of the solution, because everyone's feeling the impacts of climate change, and they also understand the huge economic opportunity of clean growth. Our member for Carleton. Well, the, the, the member still does not answer the question. She is giving an exemption to the large corporate industrial emitters. They get a 90% write-off on the carbon tax, whereas small businesses, who are the engine of job creation and growth in this country, will have to pay the tax on 100% of the energy they consume. It's just like when the Prime Minister protects his personal trust fund. Will the government end the high tax hypocrisy and extend the same exemption to our small businesses? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, uh, always pleased to stand up and once again explain how our climate plan works in the hopes that the Conservatives will finally have a climate plan that meets the target. We have a plan that's, that ensures that everyone pays a price on pollution. They, but the approach we've taken for large emitters it should be an approach that the Conservatives would support because presumably they want good jobs to stay in Canada, they want big businesses to reduce their emissions, and they also want us to grow their economy. That's the approach we've taken. It's the approach followed in Europe. It's the approach followed in Alberta. It's the approach followed in Quebec, in California, and in China. Our member for Carleton. Ah, and there's the admission that we were looking for. She said that we should support her exemption on the carbon tax for large industrial emitters because that will keep jobs here in Canada, right. which means that applying that same tax to small businesses who are the largest creators of jobs will actually send jobs out of Canada. That is her admission. She admits the carbon tax will drive jobs out of this country. If that's the case for large industrial corporations, and that's why they're getting an exemption, will she extend that exemption to small businesses, yes or no? The Earl Minister. Once again, don't take it from me that our climate plan works. Uh, take it from Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England. You need a price on carbon and you need a price on pollution. Canada, as of today, has both. It unlocks investment decisions which will make far more low-carbon economies. The Executive Director of the Canadian Associations of Physicians for the Environment, we strongly support this legislation. As health professionals, we are deeply concerned about the impacts that climate change is having and will have on the health of Canadians and people around the world. Why do the Conservatives insist on making pollution free? The RO member for North Island, Powell River. Madam Speaker, Indigenous leaders have been calling on this government to fix their broken NEB process that approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This week, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said, and I quote, it's absolutely amazing that the Prime Minister is without conscience, without any sense of responsibility to the citizens of this country and future generations. Liberals claim their most important relationship is that with Indigenous peoples, but that means nothing if they won't do the right thing. Will the Liberals start listening and cancel the pipeline expansion once and for all? Our Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Natural Resources. Madam Speaker, we understand that protecting the environment, growing the economy, and respecting Indigenous peoples can be done at the same time. The NDP do not. The, court, the Federal Court of Appeal has provided us a very clear path to move this project forward in the right way, and that is what we are doing. I encourage the members of the NDP to read the whole TMX decisions, not just the parts that they agree with. Merci, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for North Island Power River. Clearly, Madam Speaker, this government just doesn't get it when it comes to the environment and the broken NEB process. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. Let's look at the facts. Indigenous leaders are saying it's broken. Environmental groups are saying it's broken. Residents of BC and Canadians from coast to coast are saying, you've got it, it's broken. What do the Liberals do? Let's trial this failed approach just one more time. 
What will it take for this government to acknowledge the process is broken and drop the expansion? Our parliamentary secretary from the Minister of Natural Resources. Madam Speaker, obviously we are following the Federal Court of Appeals' decisions and the they direction that they are providing us. They have told us that we need to be consulting more with Indigenous uh, communities affected by the TMX pipeline, and that is exactly what we are doing right now. We, are, we respect the Court's decision and we are moving forward in the right way in meaningful dialogue. That is exactly what Canadians expect of us. That is what we're delivering. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Madam Speaker, the Liberals like to claim they are the champions of the environment, but we all know it's only for show. Behind their smiles and nice speeches, behind closed doors, the Liberals are giving favours to their oil industry friends and are buying pipelines with our money. And when the Conservatives promised to bring back Energy East, a pipeline which was massively rejected by Quebecers, the champions of the environment are opening the door to that possibility. Will the 40 Liberal MPs from Quebec commit to never reviving Energy East? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Natural Resources. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to answer that question. Energy East was a Trans-Canada business decision. I would also like to announce to the NDP that it's ironic that some members of the party support the LNG Canada project, which will create 10,000 jobs in the riding of the member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. That project will be, will be one of the most safest environmentally in the world when it comes to LNG. When it comes to the environment, we will ensure that Canadians trust our system. The member for Trois-Rivières. We are listening to what people are telling us, Madam Speaker. It's been weeks we've been asking the question and weeks that we haven't received an answer. The opposition to Energy East is massive in Quebec, in Trois-Rivières, Montreal and Quebec City. Everybody knows that this pipeline threatens the St. Lawrence River and other rivers. But in Ottawa, no one is listening. On the one hand, the official opposition is promising to bring back the pipeline. And on the other, the government cannot close the door to that possibility. What will it take for the Liberal to listen to Quebecers and to say no once and for all to Energy East. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, it, it's clear, Madam Chair, that the NDP is against uh, any major project. We are making sure that protecting the environment goes hand in hand with working with our First Nations partners. Canadians expect us to respect the environment, that we respect our First Nations, and that we also respect decisions by our courts. This is something the Conservatives don't understand, and it's clear the NDP also don't understand a thing either. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is an interesting question, period. In answer to questions by the Member for Carleton, the Minister of the Environment has said that large polluters will receive discounts because jobs might be lost. That's what the Liberal carbon tax is all about, jobs. So the question is simple, Madam Speaker, why are there two standards? Why will small businesses have to pay 100 percent, but large emitters will get a 90 percent discount? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I'm very surprised that the that a member of Quebec, every, every MP or MPP in Quebec has supported pricing carbon. So why is a member from Quebec of the Conservative Party opposed to this? It's clear that we have to fight climate change. There is a cost to pollution. So I hope that the member will listen to Quebecers who want action on climate change, who want a price on pollution, and who want a green economy. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. We, Conservatives, we respect the jurisdictions of provinces, but the Liberal government is imposing its will on the provinces as well. In Quebec, the system applies equally to all. Large, small, medium-sized polluters all are treated the same way. But why does the Liberal Party have a double standard when Quebec is treating everyone equally? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it would be important for the member to speak to someone in Quebec who understands the system. The system we have for large emitters is that 
they will have to respect the same principles which are applied in Quebec, in China, and in the European Union. We want to make sh sure that our companies are more competitive, that they will bring down emissions, and they will create good jobs in Canada. Madam Speaker, Canadian know, Canadians know that there's no way the Liberal carbon tax will save the money. Ferguson Fancy Beans, in my writing, says that the Liberal wind carbon tax alone cost them over $50,000 last year. On an admission of her own policy, the Environment Minister admitted that 90% of the exemption for big emitters focuses on keeping jobs here in Canada. Will this government extend this to Ferguson Fancy Beans as well? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I think I'll once again turn to experts. So Stephen Harper's former Director of Policy. We think that the federal government is doing the right thing in putting a price on carbon in those provinces that have not done so, and in returning the money directly to households. This will encourage lower emissions while ensuring that family, Canadian families will not be negatively affected. Dale Bergen from the Executive Director of Eco Fiscal Commission. Bigger households get bigger checks, and, more mo and most households' rebates will be larger than their carbon pricing costs. Households will see net gains. The Honourable Member for Sir Smoots Mountain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Burt Baxter Transport, a family-owned and operated company in my riding, will deeply feel the consequences of this Prime Minister's failure to support small businesses in Canada. The forced Liberal carbon tax will increase the annual cost of diesel fuel for their trucks by over $400,000 by 2022. They will have to choose between cha charging their customers more or laying off many of their employees. Where is their discount? Our own Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Whether you're a trucker or you're a farmer or you're a small business owner uh, or you're an environmentalist or you're a child, we are all paying the costs of climate change right now. We're paying the costs through extreme weather events like floods, like droughts, like forest fires, and 90 people died in Quebec this summer because of extreme heat. We are now the costs that are to Canadians. I have gone from 400,000, 400 million dollars to over a billion dollars. The UN climate climate report projects that the cost to, to uh, the world will be in the trillions of dollars if we don't take action now. It is not free to pollute, it should not be free to pollute, and our government will not allow it to be free to pollute. Our member for Yorkton Melville. Speaker, Bumbada Homes is an innovative company that will be hit hard by the Liberal carbon tax imposed on Saskatchewan businesses. It means families working hard to afford a home will now face even higher prices. It also means the Liberal affordable housing program will be more expensive. Jason and Susan know what it will mean for their business, their subcontractors and their construction workers. They know an election gimmick when they see one. Why do large corporations get exemptions from this government and they do not? Our own Minister of Environment Climate Change. You know, when I talk to small businesses, and I've talked to small businesses across the country, what do they want to do? They want to do right by the environment. They want to be more energy efficient and save money, and they also want to lower their emissions. Let me give you the example of Veriform. It's a steel manufacturer in Cambridge. What did they do? They reduced their emissions by 80 percent, and they saved a million dollars. We are going to support small businesses to do that, to be more energy efficient, so they can save money, that they can reinvest in their businesses and create more jobs. The member for Barry in this bill. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, we, we got a really deep dive into Liberal ideology earlier in question period when it comes to the carbon tax. The Minister admitted that large emitters will be exempt to save Canadian jobs, yet small and medium-sized enterprises, which employ 80 per cent of Canadians, will not be exempt. Why are these businesses and those jobs less important to the Liberals than large emitters? Isn't this just another attack on small business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's always so surprising to hear the other side talk about how much they care about jobs. We have re reduced the small business tax rate to 9%. We've created more than 500,000 jobs with Canadians. We have the lowest unemployment rate in decades. And you know what we're also going to do? We're also going to tackle climate change. We're going to save businesses money by helping them be more energy efficient. And you know what? At the end of the day, we're going to do what is critically important, is ensure that we have a sustainable planet for our kids. The R member for Windsor to come, say. Madam Speaker, a French court that was supposed to rule today on a decision that released Hassan Diab from a French prison and allowed him to come home to Canada has pushed that decision to next year. This nightmare saga has persisted for over a decade. But the government insists on carrying out a narrow review 
that will not even look at reforming our deeply flawed extradition regime. Why won't this government just do the right thing and call a public inquiry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. Madam Speaker, our government recognizes there is a legitimate interest in better understanding the process that led to Dr. Diab's original extradition under the previous government. The Minister of Justice has asked for an external third-party review of this matter so that a thorough uh, review and examination of the circumstances of that extradition to France can take place. That independent external review is being led by Murray Siegel. Mr. Siegel has been given the tools, access and discretion necessary to conduct a thorough review of the case, and we look forward to his report. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. So Germany has cut off arms sales to the Saudi regime. There's no way this government can justify this arms deal to the House of Saud. So here's a simple plan. Number one, we cancel the deal. There's not an international body anywhere that'll take the side of the Saudis. Number two, impose the Magnitsky sanctions on these criminals. Number three, we repurpose the plant in London to build military vehicles for our troops who need the upgrades. And as for the Saudi Crown Prince, Will the government do the right thing and tell him that we don't apologize to tyrants and he can go stuff his objections? The Honourable Prime Secretary, Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. In the Jamal Khashoggi affair, we demand that Canadians' arms exports are used in a way that respect human rights, and that's why we have committed to putting in place a more robust arms export system. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, we are actively looking at the existing arms exports permits to Saudi Arabia. Speaker, November 20th, 2015, James Cadmore, the CBC's military affairs reporter, broke a story. The first sentence, the new Liberal government is delaying approval of a deal to convert a civilian cargo ship into a badly needed military supply vessel. December 21st, Mr. Cudmore wrote his last story about controversial pro problems in the Navy's procurement program. His last official day at the CBC, January 8th. He started work for the Defence Minister four days later. But on what day, Madam Speaker, did the Minister offer Mr. Cudmore a job? The Honourable uh, Parliamentary, excuse me, let me get it out. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Again, I will quote sections on the sub judici convention principle outlined in Chapter 13 of the House of Commons Procedure and Practice, Third Edition. The convention recognizes the courts as opposed to the House as the proper forum in which to decide cases. And as Speaker Fraser noted, the Convention maintains a separation and mutual respect between legislative and judicial branches of government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For Thornhill. Well, Madam Speaker, the Conflict of Interest Act says a public office holder is in a conflict of interest when he or she exercises an official power, duty or function that provides an opportunity to improperly further another person's private interests. Now we know ministers often hire journalists for their communication skills to promote government policies. This seems to be the first time a journalist has been hired to block his communication skills, to shut him up. So, Madam Speaker, the date is important. When did the Minister hire Mr. Cudmore and give him a job? Prime Minister Secretary to the Ministry of uh, Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As uh, I was told that the date was provided. So. Oh, okay. But I just ask members to allow the uh, parliamentary secretary to answer the question. And if they have other questions, they'll be able to stand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The sub judici rule dictates that members are expected to refrain from discussing matters that are before the courts or tribunals, which are courts of record. Therefore, it would not be, we will not be making further com comment on that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lirab, that's false, Madam Speaker. No date was ever provided to our leader's offers with regard to when a job was offered to Mr. Cudmore and when he was hired. I don't understand how the 40 Liberal MPs from Quebec are willing to accept such absurd answers from their own government. Mario Dumont recently said with regard to the Irving lobby, 
I can't believe that Quebec's 40 Liberal MPs will agree to being less influential than one business family. My question is simple. Will the 40 Liberal MPs from Quebec finally stand up and def ask the Prime Minister to defend Davies' workers? And when was the job offer made to James Cudmore? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The government does not comment and does not speculate on issues linked to a uh, process uh, before uh, a judicial process. We believe in a, an independent judiciary. I would like to remind the member that the subjudici rule cannot be violated by public declarations, which might prejudice, files, issues, which are before the courts. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lirable. Madam Speaker, a date. No commentary, just a date. That's all we're asking for, for now. What's so secret about a date? A day, a month, a year? All dates are public, Madam Speaker. I've got a calendar here. There are lots of dates. And it's like a multiple choice question. but. And not a single date is marked confidential. So what I'm asking for is simple and public. When exactly, on what date, did the Liberal government make a job offer to reporter James Cudmore, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary? Madam Speaker, the role of the House of Commons is to help to develop public policy and legislation and to um, apply them. Police forces conduct investigations and lay charges. The courts this uh, rule on individual cases. Therefore, it would be inappropriate to comment. Thank you. In my writing of Essex, one in four kids live in poverty. That is unacceptable. Our food banks are strained. There's a lack of affordable housing. And hope for a minimum wage increase was just shattered by Doug Ford. The cancelled basic income pilot project in Ontario was helping us gather critical information on how to reduce poverty levels. While Ford continues to attack the most vulnerable, the Liberals are turning a blind eye. New Democrats join our leader Jagmeet Singh and call on the Liberals to continue this program. Will Liberals help? Or are they going to turn their back on vulnerable Ontarians too? The Honourable Minister for Families and Social Development. Of reducing poverty in Canada because this has been the objective of our government since 2015. We have started by introducing the most innovative social policy in the generation, the Canada Child Benefit, which is lifting 300,000 children out of poverty every month, and there are 200,000 parents at the same time. We have launched in August the first ever poverty reduction strategy, which is going to reduce by a further 100,000 uh, people in Canada poverty in, by March 2019. And we're going to look forward to work with other governments to make sure that this is well understood. Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Madam Speaker, the application process for the government's co-investment fund is onerous and complicated for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the rental construction, construction financing initiative geared to the private sector has less stringent criteria for affordability, environmental assessment, and accessibility. Why do nonprofit groups have to jump through more hoops to get similar benefits? Will the minister listen to feedback, allow flexibility so these nonprofits can get down to work? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Madam Speaker, we had been so pleased and so proud to work since 2015 with a number of partners in Canada that had been waiting, waited, waiting for a long, long time for the first ever national housing strategy of this country to be launched in November 2017. We've been delighted with the level of input, the quality of the advice that they were giving to us, and we look forward to work with them over the next 10 years on this $40 billion plus investment in the homes of all Canadians, in particular the more vulnerable ones. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Relationship is more important to Canada than that with Indigenous peoples, and our government is committed to building renewed relationships based on recognition of rights and mutual respect. 
the Lubicon were left out when Treaty 8 was signed in 1899, and as a result, they have been negotiating with the government for almost 40 years over their rightful title to lands and treaty benefits. Could the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations update this House on reconciliation with the Lubicon Lake Band? Federal Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations. I'd like to thank the member for Edmonton Centre for his question and his ongoing advocacy. This week, we took a historic step forward on the path of reconciliation with the Lubicon Lake Band. After decades of negotiations, our government, the government of Alberta, Lubicon Lake Band have reached agreements to finally address this historic injustice, land, compensation, and community infrastructure. As Chief Billy Joe said, this means a brighter future, a brighter economic future for their people. We acknowledge Premier Notley and her late father, the late Jim Prentice, generations of Lubicon Lake. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawatha Lakes, Brock. Madam Speaker, Bill C-69 is putting a chill on investment in Canada's natural resources sector. Sure. The President of the Indian Resource Council said, quote, Bill C-69 will harm Indigenous economic development, create barriers to decision-making, and make Canada unattractive for resource investment. This legislation must be stopped. Here, here. To make matters worse, under this Prime Minister, Canadian energy investment has seen its biggest decline in more than 70 years years. Unbelievable. When will the Natural Resources Minister kill this bill? Here, here. The, Honourable, the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. We're very pleased with Bill C-69. Why? Because we listen to Indigenous peoples, we listen to business people, we listen to people in the resource sector, we listen to uh, environmentalists. Because what did we commit to? We committed to getting our resource market, but we also committed to rebuilding trust in how we do environmental assessments. We've come up with a system that engages Indigenous peoples early, that has shorter and tighter timelines as businesses uh, were requesting. Uh, it also ensures that we make decisions based on science. We know to get our resources to market in a responsible way, we need a proper process. That's exactly what. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Minnapur. Um. Energy investment has seen its biggest decline in more than 70 years. Canadian businesses are dying, people are losing their jobs, and tens of billions of dollars are going to the U.S. economy instead of ours. And the Prime Minister's No More Pipelines bill will only make it worse. Will the Prime Minister... There seems to be a problem with translation. Is it working now? Is it working now? Is it working now? Oh. Okay, je vais y aller. Okay. Is it working? Before I continue, I just uh, I noticed that I just missed out on uh, one gentleman, so I will uh, one MP, so I will go back and then I'll come back to the member, the Honourable Member Calgary Rocky Ridge. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the Liberals' No More Pipelines bill was passed by this House with the shameful support of three Alberta Liberals. Oh. But it's not too late to stop it. Yeah. Last week, the Alberta Chamber of Commerce told the Finance Committee that any pipeline company under C69 would be foolish even to apply for any type of pipeline, mm. while the Alberta crude differential hit $50 last week. Oh. Will the Minister from Alberta do the right thing and kill this bill before it becomes the no more pipelines law. Do the right thing. The Honourable Prime Minister Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. I, actually, uh, Madam uh, Speaker, I'd like to uh, basically tell the House once again about the important investment that uh, LNG Canada is making yeah, yeah. actually in a pipeline that is going to new markets, that is being built in Kitimat. It's a $40 billion dollar investment in the Canadian economy, the largest ever private investment in Canada. It's going to create 10,000 jobs. Obviously, the Conservatives don't want to talk about that. At the end of the day, Madam Speaker, the Conservatives have failed to bring any new pipelines to new markets in 10 years. We will take no lessons from them. Next Bravo. The R member for Calgary, Minnapur. Madam Speaker, thanks to the Liberals, energy investment in Canada has seen its biggest decline in more than 70 years. Canadian businesses are dying, people are losing their jobs, and tens of billions of dollars are going to the U.S. Lost. economy They're instead of our own. Over there. And the Prime Minister's No More yeah. Pipelines bill will only make it worse. Lost and you're will the Prime Minister nice. stand up for Canadian workers, businesses, 
and our economy and scrap C69. The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary, the Minister of Natural Resources. Let me uh, repeat my answer because I was uh, obviously my colleague did not uh, did not listen or did not hear what I had to say with respect to the forty billion dollar investment. It is the largest investment in Canadian oh. history with respect to our natural resources here, here. market. Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, Conservatives failed to bring any new pipeline to new markets. We are making sure that we are going to do it in the right way. We are following the Court of Appeal decision to make sure that we are respecting Indigenous peoples, respecting the environment, and that is exactly what we intend to do, and we will make sure that we get it right. Merci. I just want to remind members, they may not like the answer, uh, but I would ask that they uh, listen and so that we can get to the next question in the proper fashion and that I can also hear the answer. The RO member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, what the Liberals failed to mention, Madam Speaker, is that that $40 billion project is exempt from their job-killing carbon tax. Now the Liberals' No More Pipelines Bill, C-69, is a threat to the livelihood of Canadians who depend on the energy sector for employment. New carbon taxes, downstream emissions regulations, and now C-69 will end energy investment in Canada as we know it. The record is clear. The Liberals have failed to get a pipeline built, and it's time for them to scrap this legislation. Will the Natural Resources Minister from Alberta do the right thing and kill this bill? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, after 10 years of inaction under the Harper Conservatives, 99% of the oil back in 2006 was being brought and sold to the U.S. markets. And in 2015, when they were voted out of office clearly, same thing, 99% of the oil was going to the U.S. markets. We are making sure that we're doing things in the proper way. We're following the court decision to make sure that we're bringing our oil to new markets. Merci. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, after a year and a half of work and several million dollars to try to solve the many problems of the Phoenix pay system, public servants are still not being paid properly. Many unions have suggested that there are resources in the system to make Phoenix work without waiting for a whole new system. There are solutions that exist. Is the government looking for them? When will they announce the next step toward a fair solution for public servants? Honourable Member for Public... The Honourable Member for Public Services and Procurement. Merci, le, Madame la Presse. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are two possible paths on Phoenix. There's my path, which is to stabilize the system for public servants. And then there's the path of the uh, uh, Treasury Board. The President is trying to find a new solution there. We're working closely with unions and we're going to do this together. For Emma Transcona. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, but I think people need to hear a more concrete answer in terms of how we're going to make progress. That's why people doubt that we are going to make progress in a timely way. It's why civilian members of the RCMP are upset that the government has reversed a previous commitment not to put them on the Phoenix payroll system until it's fixed and instead created an arbitrary deadline of 2020 where, come what may, they're going to put those RCMP members on the payroll system. Why are they risking doing material damage to the men and women of the RCMP when the payroll system isn't ready to go? And will they reverse the decision? The Honourable uh, Minister of Public Safety... Uh, public for for Services and Public procurement. Services. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I can assure everyone in this House that we are leaving no stone unturned to resolve the issues related to the Phoenix pay system. We are seeing progress. Yes, it is slow. We have re re reduced the backlog by 100,000 cases since January of this year. We have reduced the backlog of, of departments that are within the pay pod system by 21 percent. In the same time, we've, we've paid out $1.5 billion in, uh, in back pay with respect to collective agreements that weren't negotiated by the previous government. We are doing everything we can. We have 1,500 people working on this in the pay centre, and we are absolutely committed to getting this done. The I remember for Mark of Unionville. Madam Speaker, the opiate crisis is growing every year. The number of deaths due to overdose are increasing at an alarming rate. In 2016, there were just over 3,000 opiate-related deaths in Canada. In 2017, the number jumped up to almost 4,000. That is a 33 percent increase over just one year. These are preventable deaths, Madam Speaker. When will, the, when will we see the real plan from this government to address this very troubling issue? Thank you. Prime Minister, Secretary, the Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, our government is deeply concerned about the tragic effect of the opioid crisis across the country. To address the crisis, we've responded through significant new federal investments, enacting new legislation, fast-tracking regulatory action, and going forward, we continue to address the crisis by increasing access to treatment, supporting innovative approaches in harm reduction, and addressing stigma related to opioid use. We will continue to work with our stakeholders to bring forward solutions to save lives and turn the tide of this national public health crisis. The RL, uh, member for Sarnia Lambton. Well, that answer is not good enough. 16 Canadians are dying every day. In fact, Madam Speaker, more people are dying in Canada each year from the opioid crisis than from homicide, suicide, and traffic accidents combined. And the response of this Liberal government has been totally inadequate. They spent four times as much to legalize cannabis as they have trying to prevent and treat opioid addiction. When will the government take meaningful action to eliminate this crisis? The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary of the Ministry of Health. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And again, our government is incredibly concerned about the opioid crisis and the price it has uh, for Canadians on families. Building on our actions to date through Budget 2018, we're investing $231 million for additional measures to help address the opioid crisis, including $150 million for emergency treatment funding for provinces and territories. We earmarked $100 million to support the Canadian Drug and Substance Strategy and Restored Harm Reduction as a core pillar, and we're providing urgent funding to provinces hardest hit by the crisis. We will continue to work with the provinces and territories to address this crisis. Member for Sonia Lambton. Well, Madam Speaker, again, totally inadequate. The United States has recognized opioid addiction as a crisis, and they've spent 30 times the amount that was just announced, and they've focused their efforts to prevent overprescription and to prevent drugs from coming into their country. Can the Health Minister tell this House what actions have been taken to increase treatment capacity for the thousands of Canadians that need it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. So, as I said, we've earmarked $100 million to support the Canadian Drug and Substances Strategy. Unlike the Conservative government that was hard on crime and punishment, we're treating this as a harm reduction. That's we're right. looking for health strategies and science-based interventions to help people who are suffering from, uh, from dependency to opioids. We've also addressed the manufacturing. So, health, uh, we've required Canadian labeling for all prescription opioids to clarify the recommended dosing limit the quantity of opioids that should be prescribed for acute pain, and we're strengthening the warnings to people that this is a drug that could uh, create dependency. Our government supported the passage of the good... Member for Hall Eleanor. Madam Speaker, for years, we've known that the Conservative Party's idea of helping Canadian families is sending checks to millionaires. That's what they did under Stephen Harper, and the fact that they voted against the Canada Child Benefit and against the indexation of the CCB shows that they haven't changed at all. Can the Minister of Children, Families and Social Development remind this House why the CCB has been called the most significant social policy innovation in a generation? The Honourable Minister of Children, Family and Social Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I'd like to thank the member for Hall Aylmer for his remarkable support for families in his riding. The CCB has been giving more families to 9 out of 10 Canadians tax-free since July 2016. It's allowed a half million children and their parents to be lifted out of poverty, and it's uh, since the summer it's been indexed to the cost of living. Our government has committed to helping middle-class families, not just millionaires, and our CCB proves that. The Honourable Member for Best Justice at Shemani V. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Defence has contradicted, him, contradicted himself. We need two supply ships that's written in his own defence policy, which was tabled with great pomp in 2017. When will the Minister of Defence give the Obelix contract to the Davy shipyard? And why is he abandoning the Quebec economy and all of the workers at the shipyard? What are the Liberals waiting for to take action and protect our national security? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs and Associate Minister of National Defence. I can, I can assure the Honourable Member that uh, this government has put more money into national defence 
in the, uh, in the past three years, and uh, we will continue to investigate that inquiry. Uh, I will be sure to take that back to the Minister. Thank you very much. The Honourable Minister, uh, the Honourable Member for the Boys. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With November 1st around the corner, parliamentarians and Canadians will be waiting for the immigration levels plan. This past year, our minister announced an ambitious plan to grow our economy, help the middle class, and lead the world in welcoming those most vulnerable. Will the parliamentary secretary to the minister please inform the House on what to expect on November 1st? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the... Yeah, Madam Speaker, my honourable colleague from Nepean and all Canadians can expect good news on November 1st, and I thank him for the question. It's clear that he understands that a strong immigration plan is key to driving economic growth and creating good middle-class jobs for Canadians. That's why our government will continue to recruit top global talent, why we will resettle the world's most vulnerable, why we will reunite families again, here, here. cleaning up the backlogs left to us by the Harper Conservatives, oh. and Madam here. Speaker, we will build upon the record $30 billion contributed to Canada by international visitors and students last year alone. General Member for Bhopal Ivanu. Madam Speaker, for two years, official language minority communities have been calling for the Official Languages Act to be thoroughly modernized. We did it in 1988, and yesterday the Senate tabled a report that came to the same conclusion. The Official Languages Commissioner last week came to the same conclusion. Yesterday, the Liberals presented interesting measures, but they're only going to apply in 2023. When will the Liberals stop taking our linguistic communities hostage, and when will they finally take action to start modernizing the Official Languages Act? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Tourism, Official Languages, and the Francophonie. Madam Speaker, we have heard the cry from Francophone communities, and we remain committed to protecting and promoting bilingualism. After having led vast consultations, we announced an in-depth review of the Official Languages Act. The proposed changes will support and strengthen our Francophone communities across this country. Madam Speaker, it was the Liberal government who created the Official Languages Act, and it is the Liberal government who will take the necessary steps to support our official language community, communities across the country. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Madam Speaker, Quebec's ADISC Association held its annual gala on Sunday, and its last 14 presidents think that the government should take this opportunity to give our artists some good news. We need to force streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple Music to pay artists uh, fairly to fund our culture and to showcase Quebec content. But that won't happen with just consultations, nor will it happen with piecemeal measures. Will the government pass a law on electronic commerce to ensure that laws continue to apply online? Bull. The RO Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism. Uh, de ce côté de la Chambre. On this side of the House, we stand for our artists, and that is what we've shown in last year's cultural policy. Historic investments of $3.2 billion in the cultural sector, including the CBC, the Canada Council for the Arts, Telefilm, and the NFB. Due to the previous Conservative government's inaction, our laws on culture predate the internet, which is why we're reviewing them so that we can continue to support high-quality Canadian production. The principle of this review is clear. If you participate in the system, you will continue to uh, contribute. The Honourable Deputy de Joliet. The Honourable Member for Joliet. They won't announce anything on the weekend. Madam Speaker, the government will review uh, arms export permits to Saudi Arabia in the goal of getting some answers about what happened with Jamal Khashoggi. Do we really need to paint them a picture? The regime assassinated him, Ms. Madam Speaker. They did so in cold blood, just like they whipped Raif Badawi and imprisoned his sister, just like they starved children in Yemen and repressed their own population with light armored vehicles sold to them by Canada. The government has all the answers they need. Will they stop selling tanks to murderers? Our old Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Nous travaillons avec nos 
We are working with our allies to consider our options. We are currently reviewing arms exports permits to Saudi Arabia. All exports need to respect the conditions laid out in the permits. We've already frozen arms export permits in the past, and we will not hesitate to do so again. Joliet. Honorable Member for Joliet. Well, I guess we have to paint them a picture. Madam Speaker, last week the government cancelled a or forgave a two and a half billion dollar debt to Chrysler at taxpayer expense. They did so secretly without even listing the recipient in the public books. But that's not the only secret business they've been up to. GM also has a debt of over a billion dollars and has since uh, for 10 years ago. All week, when we ask what's happening with GM's debt, the government answers by talking to us about Chrysler. But GM and Chrysler are not the same thing. So who will pay for GM's debt? GM or the taxpayers? The Honourable... No one. <laughs> the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. The debt that the uh, member referred to, well, there was uh, an agreement concluded under the previous government. We eval evaluated all of the options to recuperate the money for Canadians, but this was a contract that was signed under the previous government. Thank you. That concludes uh, oral questions. Point of order. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Lisa Chamalivi. Yes, Madam Speaker. I believe that there was an interpretation problem during question period because the Minister of Veterans Affairs seems to have really not answered my question. To enlighten me, I have here the defence policy of the Canadian government. I'm sorry, but no, that is not a point of order. That is a point of debate. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Government, House Leader. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Spe uh, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 36, bracket 8, I have the honour to table in both official languages the government's responses to 32 petitions. Introduction of government bills. Déclaration de ministre. Statements by ministers. Rapport de délégation inter. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committees. Introduction of private members' bills. First reading of Senate public bills. Motion. Motions. Presenting petitions. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have two petitions to present today. The first one is with respect to Bill.